Hi, I'm Jo. I work in marketing for Cambridge University Press. Welcome to this webinar for Tom Holton. Dr. Tom Holton's written um, a great textbook called Digital Signal Processing that he has dialed in to talk to us about today. He's a professor of electrical and computer engineering at San Francisco University and has many years of teaching experience, which he has poured into this book. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tom in just a moment, but before we begin, I just want to direct your attention to the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, you should see a question and answer button um, where you can submit your questions throughout the webinar and then Tom's going to go through them and answer some of them at the end. So I just want to encourage you to submit your questions all the way through um, as they pop into your head um, and then we can have a bit of a discussion after the presentation. Tom, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Joe. Well, welcome and thanks for thanks for showing up. So I'd like to start just by giving a few minutes of my motivation for writing this book. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about some of the features and I'll show you some things as we go along. But DSP is a relatively young field, certainly compared to physics or lots of, most of mathematics. The first textbooks arrived in the 1970s, the general purpose textbooks. And I feel that they were relatively scholarly books that were aimed at uh, graduate students. And they assumed a level of mathematical sophistication that was probably appropriate to its intended audience. But teaching of DSP has evolved from a elective course for graduates to a course that's often required for undergraduates. For example, in our program, both uh, electrical engineers and computer engineers have to take a DSP course at the sort of junior, senior, undergraduate level. Um, I've been teaching DSP for well on 30 years now and probably have taught 2,500 students in that time. And I've discovered a few things. My students are, have varying mathematical abilities from those who could probably appreciate uh, one of the earlier textbooks to those who are, I would say, would struggle with basic mathematical material. Maybe you found this too, but it seems to me that the mathematical preparation of students actually gets worse <laughs> each year. So um, one has to address that. Part of the challenge is how do you engage all of these students with a relatively complicated subject. And this book is my response to that challenge. It was written for my students and students in programs like mine around the country, US and internationally as well. Um, my goal here was essentially threefold, to lay out the basic principles of DSP and a sufficient number of applications to be interesting, to excite the possibility of applying DSP to their own applications and to give them the tools to do so. So my approach, there are two basic things here. I wanted to make this an accessible and comprehensive text. And those terms have meaning for me. Accessible means simple and clear. In my mind, I had this picture of explaining the subject um, to students, a student one-on-one -on -one during my office hours. So the tone of the book is conversational and there are occasional dashes of humor, I hope, um, to keep things interesting. Concept, comprehensive means that every topic in this book, if it's described, it's described thoroughly to the point where students could apply it. And we'll see that as, as we go along, I hope. There are, so there are a large number of examples, illustrations, there's code, uh, and there's also for instructors <coughs> animations, which I'm going to show you. There's a lot of emphasis on the earlier chapters, which contain the basic material, which is necessary to understand the advanced material. And there is quite a lot of advanced material. It's both within the chapters themselves as the kind of the later sections or starred sections. It's in supplementary material that's available online um, 
and it's in the later chapters of the book as well, the final three or four chapters. This book features a kind of a balance of theory and application. Um, there's always a trade-off between theory and application, but in terms of theory, I have worked out all derivations in full, sometimes multiple times if they're important derivations in different ways, or if they're really tedious derivations, I've let them go to the supplementary material or to what I call guided problems. In no case did I ever want to say the proof is left to the reader because often it's just neglected then. I also have a lot of details of hardware and software implementations where appropriate. I may highlight some of those as I uh, go along. MATLAB. Well, MATLAB is the standard computing language and computer envir uh, environment for DSP algorithm development for better or worse. And um, it's become kind of de rigueur to include MATLAB in any text. Uh, sometimes I feel gratuitously, but I have integrated it in this text in a number of ways. First of all, just the language basics. So the early chapters step you through ways of doing some DSP using basic appendix, appendix C. But I tell my students um, somewhat sarcastically that you can write a MATLAB program if you know any real language, C, Python, Java, and most of the students come in with some programming application, uh, some programming language. DSP has a, uh, MATLAB has a lot of DSP toolbox functions. And although I have resisted cataloging every single MATLAB function, it's important to mention a few, and I do quite a lot of that, for example, in the chapters on FIR and IIR filtering. However, just mentioning the toolbox functions is not enough. Um, for one thing, it doesn't give students a clue how to design or implement a filter for themselves, for example, on a microcontroller. And it also weds them to the MATLAB toolbox, which I don't like. So in this text, I include algorithms that are written from scratch using MATLAB essentially as a uh, pseudocode. Finally, um, and there are a lot of code examples that are integrated into the text or in the supplementary material. And finally, in my classes, in my courses, there are laboratory exercises that are required weekly or every other week where students have to take the material they've learned in lecture and they have to program stuff and submit assignments. <clears throat> and I'll talk about that. So let's go to the book first. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to thank Cambridge for their, for their hard work in making this book happen. And Julie Lancashire and her team really went all out to produce a, a beautiful book. Um, like you guys, I've probably evaluated dozens of books in my career. Uh, and I might be biased, but this book is uncommonly handsome. It's beautifully designed. It's in four color, which is very rare for an engineering book. And it's case bound, which means the pages are sewn in and they're not going to fall out when you try to lie the uh, when, when the book lays, uh, lies flat on the, on the table. So thank you, Cambridge. Now to the contents of the book, um, there are uh, over a thousand pages, 14 chapters, four appendices, over 600 full color illustrations, 200 examples, hundreds of problems. Complementing the book, there's a wealth of supplementary material that's available online, a further 100 pages of text and uh, 70 illustrations. There's a full set of problem set solutions, which are typeset. <clears throat> there are the MATLAB lab exercises that I mentioned. And for instructors, I have something special. Over two dozen programs, which are kind of show you with animations for, for instructors. Uh, to help students with the concepts that are being learned in the lectures. 
Let's go to the contents of the book. So the first chapter is your basic signals and systems, the usual suspect sequences, linearity and time invariance, causality, stability, and periodicity. And as I go through these topics on the left side, you'll just see examples of pages. And to be honest, I've just shown them because they've got nice figures in them. <clears throat> the second chapter, main chapter is uh, impulse response, which is again, the usual suspects, convolution and deconvolution, um, and overlap add, overlap save. I do that here and I also do that in the context of the FFT. Next chapter is DFT, is complex exponentials, response to cosines, difference between FIR and IIR filters, magnitude and phase, and a ton of stuff on the properties. Linear phase system shows up here and in three other chapters because it's a very important topic which uh, I felt necessary to cover multiple times. Next chapter is Z transforms, which includes pole zero plots, inverse transforms and the like, all the properties. A, a related chapter is um, frequency response, which is the relation between the Z transform frequency response and the impulse response. So here we do a lot of stuff having to do with uh, real and complex singularities and all pass filters, and also once again, linear phase filters. <clears throat> and here, if I might, I thought I'd show you one of the um, programs that I use in my lectures to demonstrate things. <clears throat> so what we have here, on the top right is pole zero plot. Over here is magnitude and phase of the um, frequency response. And here will be shown the impulse response. So I can specify a Z transform, call it H of Z, um, in a number of ways. For example, here, I'll do this with the, uh, by specifying the numerator and denominator polynomials of H of Z expressed as powers of Z to the minus one. So here you've got a zero at zero, and here you have a zero, at, and here you have a pole at a half. And in addition, um, there's the frequency responses over here, and you can change the frequency extent of the plot, impulse responses down here. In addition, you could specify H of Z in terms of powers of Z, as you see here, either in Cartesian coordinates or in polar coordinates. And you can also specify the Z transform just by going ahead and dragging singularities around on the Z plane. Or uh, you can drag them in from this dock here. There we go here. here. Come on. There we go. And in this case, the region of convergence is the exterior of the outermost pole, so the frequency response doesn't exist. This is an unstable system. You can see it's got a right-sided uh, expanding response, but you can also show uh, here's a left-sided, also unstable system, and here's a two-sided stable system. Uh, if we go back to what we had before, control Z, control Z, um, let me go ahead and move it. No, no, let me just leave it this way. Um, I'll put the, this zero at 0 0.25 just for laughs. And you can show, for example, uh, the response of just the pole, the response of the zero by itself, or the response of everything. Poles in red, zeros in blue, and um, the net response with the black uh, dashed line. And you can also interrogate with the cursor what the values of magnitude and phase are. So that's just an example. And there are tons of other features of this, um, which are described in the manual that accompanies these for instructors. Returning to the chapter, next chapter is a big one. Analog to digital and digital to analog converters. 
And here I felt it was important to start first with analog sampling and reconstruction. So I cover this in a number of, of different ways. We talk, of course, about Nyquist criteria, aliasing, anti-aliasing and reconstruction filters. There are a bunch of applications having to do with how would you um, do this in the context of a recording a, a, a CD, for example. Downsampling, upsampling, resampling. Quantization is discussed in pretty big detail. And then I have a long discussion about A to D and D to A architectures, such as oversampling and noise shaping uh, A to D converters and sigma delta converters. And I guess before I go on to the next chapter, let me show you just one more. Why not? Let me show you another program. So here, let me grab a sound. I ask you folks to turn down your speaker because I'm gonna be playing some sound here. So here it is. So she sells, she sells seashells. seashells. Spoken by a robust male speaker who will not be named. What I say is that this is, for example, the spectrum on this top right panel of that sound. Let's just say that it is, and here's the time waveform that corresponds to that spectrum. Now we sample that here at four kilohertz, roughly. And the output of the sampling and reconstructed signal, so the reconstruction filter is shown in the um, cyan shaded block here, and the output is shown here. Obviously, the she same. sells seashells. And now we begin to change the sample and lower it. And let me go ahead and blow up this picture a little bit. And as we lower the sample rate, of course, the image replicas begin to intrude upon the baseband. And now you have aliasing, and you can see that in the reconstructed signal. And when you play it, I mean, let me she make sells this really seashells. Bad. Sounds like I've dented she it. She sells seashells. Very well. And of course, you can put on an anti aliasing filter to precede the input with an anti-aliasing filter to the input to the A to D converter. And there you get a muff of low pass sells filter, seashells. but at least it's not aliased. Okay, so that's another one of the programs that I use. And there are actually three or four programs uh, that I use to do A to D and D to A conversion. Next topic, FIR filtering. This is again, a very long chapter. I do quite a lot of stuff that's not in other books. Um, in other beginning textbooks. Again, linear phase filters. When I teach this, I really only manage to do window-based filters, such as Hamming and Kaiser, or I do high pass, low pass, band stop, spline, raise cosine filters. And I do, in my classes, I actually do frequency sample filters and least square error filters. Optimum filters, I mentioned in the chapter, that's Parks McClellan, but there's an extended discussion of this in the supplementary material. All of these filters, incidentally, you can see a tiny little segment of code here. All of these filters have code segments so that you can implement them directly in MATLAB. They're not left just as equations. Multiband filters, and different shapes, and Hilbert transformer with occasions. In this case, I guess you can see uh, demodulation of an AM signal and uh, phase shift keying. IR filters. <clears throat> Another case where I've used, I've started with the classic analog fil filter types, four of them, Butterworth, Chebyshev, and inverse Chebyshev. And I also do elliptic filters. And a lot of textbooks, what happens is people say they're too complicated. And you know what? They are complicated. But I've made a, a a decent stab at making them accessible and including code which uh, students can use to implement elliptic filters 
uh, from scratch in MATLAB without using the toolbox functions. <clears throat> Elliptic filters are, are very uh, powerful filters, so it's useful to, to talk about them. I leave most of impulse invariance to the supplementary material and concentrate on bilinear transformation. But I also do a lot of the spectral transformations, lo low pass to low pass, high pass, and uh, band pass filters. And then finally, I talk about zero phase uh, IAR filtering. Filter architecture, canonical and transposed filters, cascade parallel. There is an extensive discussion of lattice and lattice ladders and their applications in the later chapters, and also coefficient quantization, I'm trying to make coefficient quantization easy. And finally, um, I felt it was necessary to talk about considerations of implementations of, of filters, the architecture that you would use, for example, in VLSI. Why you would, for example, favor transposed architectures, self-pipelined architectures. Okay. Well, we're coming to the end. Have faith. Okay. D it's derivation, circular shift, and convolution, and it's, it's allied chapter on the FFT. And this is chapter is actually posted in full online. Cambridge decided to do that, so you can read this whole chapter. You see decimation, time decimation, and frequency. I haven't covered every one of them. Very many types of FFT algorithms. But I've covered quite a few of them, both here and in the supplementary material, both uh, radix two composite and split radix uh, transformations, and then applications such as fast transform, iterative and not iter iterative implementations, and uh, some tricks to use for using FFTs of real sequences. Okay, that completes the base material for this course. It's about 750, 60 odd pages. Exclusive of the appendices, I had very little, very few pages left. Based on my feelings and on the feelings of over 20 reviewers who looked at this material at various stages of its production, I felt, or we felt, I guess, that there were a number of chapters a number of topics that had to be covered in addition. You can't have everything, so I had to choose. I chose to discuss the DCT because the DCT is at the heart of two applications that the students use every day. It turns out that there are over a billion photographs, for example, that are uploaded to Facebook every day. So every student has familiarity with the JPEG. In addition, students with the music that they steal online uh, are very familiar with MPEGs, MP3 files. And so I felt it necessary to discuss those. And the DSP behind that is the discrete cosine transform and its uh, uh, specializations, the modified discrete co cosine transform. So those are described in this chapter. I derive uh, the, the DCT and its properties as usual in the DCT2. But then I have a, dis a long discussion of the MP3 file and JPEGs. In fact, there's a lab, the final lab, where the students can, if the instructor assigns it, implement in MATLAB a full JPEG encoder and decoder. Pretty neat. Um, the next chapter that I felt had to be there was multi-rate and polyphase systems. I'll be honest with you, this was a tough chapter to write at a level which I felt students of all back mathematical backgrounds could get. And I did it in two ways. I did it both in the time domain because that's the easiest to visualize. And there are a ton of pictures which help people visualize uh, polyphase downsampling, upsampling, and resampling. And I also did it in terms of transform analysis, which is the easiest way to understand it mathematically. I did multi-stage downsampling and upsampling and 
then multi-rate systems, uh, multi-stage and multi-rate filters of various descriptions. And I end up with half band and Nyquist filters. Uh, in the supplementary material, there's an enormous amount of other information uh, going on to filter banks and so on. I'll talk about that later. The final chapter, <clears throat> you'll be maybe happy to hear, spectral analysis. Another tough chapter to write at an elementary level, which is nevertheless comprehensive. So here we have, start with effects of windowing, and spectral resolution. I do both non-parametric methods, which are basically periodogram based, and parametric methods based on armor model, for example. It's an Durbin algorithm and linear prediction and the short-term uh, Fourier transform. Okay. In addition to the text, as I mentioned, there's a variety of material available online, the so-called supplementary material. And I'm going to flash this by you pretty quickly so that we can move on to your questions. Unilateral Z-transform I left for supplementary material. I discuss a lot of the architecture, that is the hardware of A to D and D to A converters, including flash, subranging, pipeline A to D, all kinds of stuff. This is sometimes the only time that students will see this in their career, particularly if they're computer science students, for example, but they should if they're going to apply things. And finally, D to A converters of various descriptions. FIR filter topics, there are a few additional topics I wanted to cover, time aligned zero phase filters, uh, integral least square error filters, and there's an extensive discussion of the Parks McClellan uh, fil filters. Oops, there we go. Parks McClellan filters. These are things that have to be done with a lot of pages, and I couldn't put it into the textbook. Okay. Additional IR filter topics. Most of the uh, impulse invariance topics were left here for the supplementary material. D DFT topics and a few of them and a few additional uh, FFT architectures as well. Things like split radix. Okay. Now for the DCT, I felt that I would take a stab at doing the modified DCT and its windowed versions, which are what are really underlying the MP3 files. And I think I did this a number of ways to make it clear to students, both in terms of uh, non-matrix and in terms of matrix methods. So I've de derived it multiple ways with lots of pictures to help students show things. Prince and Bradley conditions for uh, ideal reconstruction, uh, perfect reconstruction, matrix forms. And a lot of code where Matt where students can implement the whole thing in MATLAB. Polyphase topics, I had to add some additional ones, both in terms of time do domain derivation and a lot of MATLAB code, which I put in. You can see a big chunk of MATLAB code to implement polyphase filters <clears throat> in MATLAB. I also throw in a few other things because they got so huge, I put all of the multi-rate topics in the supplementary material. So for example, multi-rate filter banks, uh, both two-channel ideal and non-ideal, QMF filters, uh, and other topics like that. I'll just let the PowerPoint speak for itself. Okay, and finally, there were a few spectral analysis topics that I felt I had to add linear prediction lattice filters and um, the line spectral frequencies. Okay, that's it for the supplementary materials. Um, I'm going to just show you some of the topics in the lab exercises, and then I'll I'll take talk about one of them. Okay. 
because I'm running out of steam. Each chapter more or less has a lab exercise associated with it. So the signals and systems has flip and shift labs. I do some clever things here to get around the ones based indexing that MATLAB has. In the impulse response, they have to implement convolution and deconvolution. And actually in another lab, you can do uh, overlap, save and overlap add and overlap save. DFT, Z transform labs, A to D and D to A conversion, they'll implement downsampling, upsampling, and resampling. And in FIR filters, there are a number of labs where they'll implement the basic window-based filters and, and also uh, spline filters and other types of filters as well. And here I thought <clears throat> I'd show you a little bit of that. So here's the lab manual. And if I go to page, there's all the labs. Go to page 46. Here in this lab, this is one of the FIR filter labs. So they learn to do basic filters, low pass and high pass filters. And then I say, here's a problem for you. Here's the DTMF tone. So that's the, the multi-tone, dual tone modulation frequency, which are in uh, touch tone type keypads. And so in this, you have column tones and row tones. And you add a column tone, which is below a kilohertz, to a, a, a row tone, which is below a kilohertz, to a column tone, which is above a kilohertz. And the sum of those two tones specifies an individual key, one of the uh, 12 keys there. And I'll let me show you this program that goes along with that. So they're, one of their tasks is to separate the row tones from the column tones. And here is how I explain it in my lab sessions. So first let's create ourselves a filter. And here I'm gonna make a Kaiser filter and I'm going to grab a sound and I'm going to ask you once again to make sure that your um, speakers are muted. Don't grab the same sound, good old seashell. Okay. So the middle panel here shows the spectrogram of seashell. She sells and seashells. You can, um, grab a little piece of that. So here's the she from she. And what I'm doing for panels is I'm real time filtering this with that Kaiser filter. So here I'm going to filter it below about a kilohertz. Or here I'll filter it above a kilohertz. And actually, let me get another sound. This one, let me get the, the, the phone tones. And when I filter below a kilohertz here, I'm going to basically cut off. Here is the spectrogram of the phone tones. So you can see the row tones are below 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, star 0 pound. Let's play a single one of them. And here's what happens when I filter out the column tones. And here's the whole thing played. So here is all of them. And here's the filtered version. So that's what they have to do in lecture. Obviously, not with this spiffy interface. But this helps me describe to them what their, what their task is. And here, for example, I would filter out the lower tones, and just grab a little bit, move it over. Okay. And in this panel, you can see the sum of the tones, and here's the, the one that remains. Okay. So that's one of the labs, uh, one of the labs that I use. The last lab is a full explanation of how to do 
the DC uh, to do use the DCT, the two dimensional DCT, to do a JPEG encoder and de decoder, including things like chrominance subsampling and um, run length encoding and Huffman encoding, minimum entropy coding. So all of that they do and they can do in MATLAB. Coming to the end, we'd be happy to hear. All right. Finally, the topics in IIR filtering. They implement a Butterworth filter using bilinear transformation and in spectral analysis. I have a couple of labs, only one of which I've included. And in this one, they actually do a decoding of the DTMF tone. So they have to, it's an open ended project where you're given a sound file, possibly one which is corrupted with an enormous amount of noise, and you have to decode what the digit stream was that was pressed into the keypad. The final thing I'm going to mention, I think, is the, um, the instructional programs. So as I said, there are 24 of them covering a whole range of topics, complex exponentials and sinusoids, convolution, DTFT, Z-transform, and frequency response, A to D and D to A conversion. That's the one I showed you, but there are a couple more. Convolution uh, FIR filtering. First, I described, for example, in this one, how you make a window-based filter from an ideal low-pass filter how to make bandpass and high pass filters. This one I just showed you. IIR filtering and its relation to pulse zero plot and its transforms. The DFT, shifting and convolution. The DCT, um, how to do a uh, JPEG encoder and explaining uh, chrominance subsampling. Phew. So that's the end of my presentation. I've described for you the different components of this, really this package. There's the book, supplementary material, lab exercises for students, problem set solutions, and finally, these uh, instructor programs. And all of this is, I think, now available uh, for your perusal at uh, cambridge.org slash Holton. Thank you. Thank you, lovely. So um, we've got a couple of questions in already. Um, if anyone's thought of new questions as we've gone through, please feel free to submit them in the question and answer box. Tom, can you can you see those, or do you need me to read them to you? How do I do that? I just I mean I can look at them, and I'll just I'll just say, have there been any noticeably difficult DSP concepts that you had personally had issues conceptually grasping? Uh, yeah, all of them. <laughs> uh, I took this course when I was a grad student at MIT, and Oppenheim was teaching it. Okay, um, so. It was a difficult course, but it was one that I liked an enormous amount and ended up doing signal processing in industry, for example, uh, as well as teaching. Um, I think it's the neatest of the engineering topics that I've taught. I've taught quite a few of them. And because some of these topics are difficult for me as an instructor to have grasped, I felt I was positioned once I could explain it to my satisfaction, I could explain it to the satisfaction of anybody. It requires a lot of figures. All those figures in the book, 600, are made by me. Um, and I use them in my lectures. Um, one of the respondents asked, when I deliver it, how many contact hours of lectures? So um, these are undergraduates for me and they're in their second or th they're in their third or fourth year of a four fourth year program. 
they have to have had in our system, they have to have had analog signal processing first, essentially for a transform analogs at Fourier transform, Fourier series, Laplace, and so on. There are three hours of lectures, and in my course, there's a mandatory three-hour lab a week. And in addition, we've uh, whatever additional time is necessary in office hours. Um, the same person says they include Bessel filters. Yes, Bessel filters are nice. I have had to describe um, I had to choose, and I chose four of them. I chose elliptic filters rather than Bessel filters, because actually elliptic filters have the smallest order for a given uh, sharpness, and uh, also because it was a real challenge to explain them uh, coherently. Do you have C code examples for implementing filters? Uh, only a couple. Uh, this is a book with MATLAB code. And as I mentioned, you can, because MATLAB is such a simple system, um, I don't use C. I do when I, for example, talk about how to implement convolution, because there you have to talk about things like circular buffers. And that is requires pointers, which is a, something that of course MATLAB does not have. Have you found MATLAB programs run concurrently on Octave? I mentioned this in my uh, in my Appendix C, which is that I've written everything using straight MATLAB. So it may or may not run in Octave or in uh, MATLAB clones, but I haven't tested it. I've only used um, basic MATLAB. Three hours per week, how many weeks? Uh, we have, what, 13 weeks of instruction, a full semester, half a year. So we go from, for example, the spring term goes from the end of June to the end of May, three times a week on a one hour per uh, lecture course or two times a week on a one and a half hour lecture. If you have only 15 hours of lecture and 15 hours of lab time, how to cover basic DSP. So the way I've structured this book is I, I liken this book when I talk to its students with a, with a bulldozer. It's slow and it goes uphill, but it goes uphill regardless of the slope of that hill at the same speed. <laughs> so when I talk about this stuff to my students, I go slowly through the first sections of a number of chapters and I don't cover everything. Okay, in my course, I don't get usually to the last chapters. I will cover in detail um, convolution, DTFT, Z transforms, and FIR and, and um, frequency response. So those chapters. Then I will usually choose only the window based filters from FIR. And if there's sufficient time, I may do one IAR filter, and that tends to be it. I might be able to do um, the DCT and circular convolution. Depends on how good the group is and depends on the amount of time I have. For example, I've noticed in giving Zoom lectures, I can't cover more than uh, two thirds of what I can normally cover because I'll ask questions in a Zoom meeting and there'll be silence, you know? Whereas when I'm in face-to-face -face in lectures and I ask questions, I can see on people's faces whether they got it or not, whether I can speed up or slow down. So it depends. Some terms I can get all the way through DCT and FFT, uh, uh, sorry, DFT and FFT, and some terms I cannot. The use of hardware in DSP books. Do I recommend something simple to implement DSP on commonly available processors? I think there are such things. I don't know about them, but you can always write these programs in C on the Arduino. And most of my students, we have mandatory lab, uh, mandatory uh, capstone projects <clears throat> where sometimes they will implement, uh, for example, filtering to do data smoothing 
on the Arduino in C, and it's pretty simple once they've looked at the code in the books, in my books. Okay. Um, I think that's it for the questions. So I will, uh, I will thank you all for coming and I hope you will be able to look online and, and check out what's on offer there. Thank you very much.